Hi, dance friends. We're starting with a pop quiz this week. Which of the following celebrities has not attended one of DJ D Nice's club quarantine virtual dance parties? Michelle Obama, Jennifer Lopez, Elizabeth Warren, Naomi Campbell, Drake, Oprah, Jimmy Fallon, Joe Biden, Rihanna, or Usher? Again, who from that list has not attended one of D Nice's giant Instagram Live dance parties? The answer at the end of this episode of the Dance Edit podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Dance Edit Podcast. I'm Margaret Fuhrer. I'm Courtney Escoin. And I'm Lydia Murray. We're editors at Dance Magazine and Dance Spirit Magazine, um, recording remotely again, as we will be for the foreseeable future. Um, On this week's podcast, we'll be getting into some of the many, many coronavirus-related dance stories that broke over the past few days. Uh, We'll be discussing the Royal Ballet's dismissal of former artist-in-residence Liam Scarlett, And we'll be talking about some of the artists and companies who've been moving us with their virtual dance performances. Um, But first, um, a reminder that this podcast is a companion to our daily email newsletter, which keeps you on top of all the dance world's news, pandemic related and otherwise. Um, So go sign up for the Dance Edit newsletter at thedanceedit.com. So now for our first news segment. And actually, it feels wrong to call it a news segment when this kind of news feels all consuming. Um, The coronavirus emergency continues to fundamentally alter the landscape of the dance world, and artists and companies continue to search for ways to cope with all of that upheaval and uncertainty. We don't even need to tell you this, really, but hundreds of performances have been canceled or postponed. Most dance schools have closed. Most theaters are shuttered. Effectively, the dance world is, is closed for business. So now focus has shifted a little to helping those who've been affected. Um, And we wanted to go a little deeper into two stories about coronavirus relief efforts, both big and small. Uh, Yeah, so good news for the Broadway community. Uh, So as you know, Broadway theater shuttered on March 12th, um, and unions and Broadway producers met and came up with a uh, real temporary relief program for unionized Broadway workers. Uh, They are essentially for Two and a half weeks, they are going to be receiving contracted pay as well as health benefits. Health benefits have also been negotiated to remain in place through April 12th, which is currently the date through which the Broadway closure extends. However, the two of the sides have agreed to meet and discuss extending health care beyond that point before we reach that point, uh, because the shutdown at this point is looking likely to extend to May or possibly even June. And also the Dance NYC Coronavirus Dance Relief Fund um, serves New York City area freelance dance workers and dance making organizations. Um, And something that I really like about that is that it prioritizes supporting communities most impacted by COVID-19, including several minority groups. Yeah, there are also a couple of um, mask related initiatives happening in the dance community across the dance community right now. Oh, yeah. So uh, both Tulsa Ballet and Milwaukee Ballet have uh, turned their costume shops into places where masks are being made for medical professionals. As we all know, that's a major need. Um, Shortages are being seen in a lot of places. So it's a really brilliant way to keep the uh, costume shop staff uh, working, paid, while also doing good for the broader community outside of the dance world. And also within the ballroom dance world, Tony Dovolani, who is a former Dancing with the Stars professional, currently international dance director of Fred Astaire Dance Studios, has teamed up with uh, the president and CEO of the healthcare healthcare consulting firm Advis to produce respiratory masks for healthcare workers. Um, There have been a lot of canceled ballroom dance events that have put some ballroom dance costume makers out of work, so they'll be using their skills to help the effort in this, this slow period. And we should mention, too, that um, Dance USA has an ongoing advocacy campaign to ensure that dance is included in all of Congress's relief packages. Um, So please lend your support there. They still need it. And there are smaller fundraisers and special grant programs happening all over the place. Um, If you're looking for assistance, there's actually a good roundup of places to seek it on Dance Magazine's website. Um, If you're Googling the story, I think it's called How Dancers and Dance Organizations Can Prepare for the Financial Fallout of COVID-19. And if you're looking for ways to help, um, most straightforward advice, start local, see what your community needs, work your way outward. 
Also, one of the simplest, easiest things that you can do as a dance artist right now, uh, Dance USA, Dance NYC, and American for the Arts all have surveys uh, looking at how artists are being di- impacted by this pandemic. Uh, take five minutes, take 10 minutes, fill it out. Not only is it going to help them demonstrate the impact to lawmakers in their advocacy efforts, it's going to help them direct resources and efforts to where they are most needed. Um, we also want to touch on the fact that, you know, we're sort of expected to find comfort in in positive motivational stories like these, you know, costume shops making masks and, you know, famous ballet dancers streaming their classes, big Instagram dance parties. Some people do find comfort in that kind of news, but that's not the way that everybody copes. And it doesn't reflect the reality of everyone's situation, especially in the dance community. Right. Um, This can be a challenging time for mental health. Recently, Minding the Gap, which is an organization founded in 2018 by Kathleen McGuire Gaines, who's a frequent dance magazine contributor who we love. Yes. Um, They published a blog post about how dancers can honor their mental health during the outbreak. And in the piece, mental health professionals discuss the ways in which the shutdown can affect dancers. They mention the need for social connection because dancers are typically part of a cohesive community. They mentioned a loss of structure because dancers tend to have set routines of going to dance class or performing, uh, preparing for a performance. And those things can give a sense of comfort or stability. Um, and some dancers might be far from home or they might have dysfunctional family environments that can lead to the studio serving as home for them. Um, and lately on social media, I think a lot of us have seen um, some really great positive motivational dance content, um, which is fantastic. But I have wondered a little bit about the potential for dancers who might be coping differently to see that and wonder if they should be taking the same approach or maybe see someone else and think, oh, am I taking this harder than I should be? Um, and in the dance world, I feel like there's this value of resilience at all costs, um, which a recent Dance Magazine article also talked about, um, and that that can use some reevaluation. So um, I think something I want to point out from that article, a quote was, um, if dancers can embrace feelings of vulnerability that are coupled with a conscious awareness of their emotional resources, then they can maintain a healthy balance between feelings and adaptation, um, which I think is important. Um, And similarly, I think the fallout from the coronavirus underscores the privilege gap in the dance world, because not everyone, yeah, not everyone can afford to quickly leave a highly affected area, or um, not everyone has a place to go where they can be emotionally or psychologically or even physically healthy. Um, And of course, we don't all have the same levels of financial support and so forth. Um, And that can have a longer term impact on the dance landscape because it can affect who gets to continue creating work and what kinds of work survive. Um, Of course, fortunately, the the funding efforts that we talked about earlier can help that. Um, And some therapists are offering mental health services to dancers for free, which is also great. Yeah, if you... um... If you are looking for uh, mental health support or services, uh, Leo Zelenska, who is an incredible dancer, a uh, former Dance Magazine 25 to Watch pick, um, she's currently an artistic associate at Gibney Company, and her platform, OK, Let's Unpack This, focuses on mental health in the dance world. And she has been using that platform to collect a list of counselors and therapists who are providing pro bono mental health services to dancers via Skype, via uh, phone. Uh, you can find that at okokok.org. Okay, okay, okay. That's O-K-A-Y. Or through the link on the OK Let's Unpack This Instagram bio. So in our next news segment, we're actually going to talk about a, a pretty major piece of news that kind of flew under the radar this week with all the coronavirus coverage. The Royal Ballet has severed ties with choreographer Liam Scarlett, who had been the company's artist in residence since 2012. Um, The announcement came this week via a very brief press statement, and it follows Scarlett's suspension in August of last year after allegations of sexual misconduct were made against him. Pretty serious ones. Um, The company conducted an investigation into the allegations, but it said in its statement that it, quote, found there were no matters to pursue, end quote. So it seems like there are a lot of questions in the air here, but there are some echoes here, I think, of of New York City Ballet's misconduct scandals, especially the way that the Peter Martin's allegations were handled, where Mm -hmm. allegations were made, an investigation happened. He ultimately did step down, consequences happened, and yet the official verdict was still ultimately something like, nothing to see here. It's, It's just a little 
strange. It just feels strange. Yeah. Um, and we should mention that that, you know, when the allegations first the story about the allegations first broke, that was back in January, although he had actually been suspended in August. So yes. it was sort of kept under the rug for a long time and and the allegations themselves sound I mean pretty extreme. And it's also it should be noted, uh the Royal Ballet hasn't really said anything all that much about what the allegations entailed, what we know about it. And the reason the story broke when it did is that the uh, Times in London actually broke the story because uh, one of these students or former students alleging misconduct came forward. Um, and that's kind of the only reason that this came out when it did. And there's also the fact that the company went ahead with Scarlett's production of Swan Lake in February. Which it is a very expensive new production of Swan Lake. It was a very big deal when it premiered because their War Horse production had been in place for so long. Um, it was also very well received. Um, so presumably there were some financial considerations there. Right. I'm sure it, it's you can see what, what the motivations were. I think it's just there are, there are moral and ethical questions at, at stake, too. When this news did break in January, I remember having several conversations about, like, do you think the reason that they aren't uh, revealing more details is, like, you know, there might be privacy issues because we're talking about things that potentially involved minors. Maybe that's why they're keeping a lid on it. Mm -hmm. And so I think we were very much giving the benefit of the doubt of, okay, this is being handled the way it needs to be handled. And I think now the way that this is kind of concluded has maybe put this in a little bit of a different light. Uh-huh. I, I think stories like these are, are a reminder that while the dance world is making real progress when it comes to the way sexual harassment claims are addressed, I mean, leaps and bounds from even just a few years ago, we still have a ways to go. A long way to go. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, in our next segment, let's bring the conversation back to dance artists making beautiful art. Specifically, we wanted to talk about the dancers who moved us on Instagram this week. Um, first, a few days ago, the official Ailey Instagram account posted a really poignant video collage featuring, I think, 10 of the company's dancers, each in their separate homes, um, performing the same section of I've Been Buked from Alvin Ailey's classic work, Revelations. It's iconic. And then inspired by that project, um, Houston Ballet soloist Har Harper Waters then posted another video featuring Houston Ballet dancers performing a section of Stanton Welsh's Clear each in their separate spaces. So we saw all of these artists dancing alone and yet together. I cried. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, especially in the wake of Ailey's, uh, you know, they spend so much of the year on tour and Revelations is how they close every tour performance. Um, if you've seen Ailey, you've seen Revelations. And it's so important and so special. And so the fact that like their spring tour was canceled and so they're not able to bring this incredibly moving a uh, peace to a country that kind of sorely needs it right now. I think this is such a balm in this moment. Yeah. And I love that in both pieces, you really get to appreciate the raw talent and technique that all the dancers have. Um, and it's great to see their humanity and their artistic brilliance um, just on full display in a really interesting way. They're being themselves, they're at home, but they're also bonding with the audience in a way that's unusual because of this shared experience we all have. Yeah, and both these pieces, I mean, Revelations especially, but also Clear, Stanton Mosh is Clear, they're sort of signature works for their respective companies. And they involve similar movements. You can see why Harper thought, oh, Clear would be a piece that we would do to make kind of a response video to the Ailey video. They're not, while you can definitely see the the virtuosity of the dancers, they're not virtuosic pieces. There's more, rather than this emphasis on, look, what, what our bodies can do, it's this feeling of a sense of community in spite of physical distance. Um, and then also, especially in the Ailey piece, a feeling of sort of, yeah, collective mourning for those performances not danced. So they really hit hit a chord, I think, with a lot of viewers this week. Um, for our last segment this week, we're going to talk a little bit about what we're streaming. Um, so as dance editors, part of our job is usually seeing a lot of li live dance, which I know we have really rough lives. Um, recently, <laughs> we've gone from spending three or four nights a week in a theater to nada. Um, and I don't want to lose perspective even for a minute 
here. This dis disorientation that we're feeling is it's nothing compared to the losses of the performing artists and the theater workers. All the compassion belongs with them. But as we all kind of wait for the day when the lights go on again in all these theaters, um, we and a lot of dance enthusiasts out there, I think, have turned instead to the great dance content that is available online. So we thought we'd share some of our favorites with you. Um, so my first favorite shout out, it actually isn't a full performance footage, but um, so David Halberg and Natalia Asapova uh, were scheduled to dance their first ever Swan Lake together um, at the Royal Opera House, which the fact that they had never done Swan Lake together before is kind of wild. Um, <laughs> and that performance was canceled. Um, so what they did was they put a video of them rehearsing the second act Pada de on Instagram, and it's heartbreakingly beautiful. Um, and it just, I think it's particularly poignant because not only is this like really an iconic and storied partnership in its own right, um, David's retiring really soon. He's going to take over at Australian Ballet in January, um, give his you know, ABT farewell in summer 2021. And so odds are they're not gonna ever get to dance this together on stage. Um, and so like getting to see this little snippet of it, I think was really special. And also I would like to now petition for ABT to bring Natalia to the Metropolitan Opera House for David's farewell so they can do this. <laughs> I just wanted to note that Center Stage is currently available on Netflix. Yes, yes, it is yes, a yes great dance movie it is a great movie period and it's just like comfort food like watching it feels like eating a big chocolate chip cookie while snuggled under a blanket actually sometimes i'm literally doing those things while i'm watching it um i am still team wouldn't it be better if we all just did triples <laughs> <laughs> right so many quotable quotes and then the other thing that i've been doing is dance spirit recently started a tiktok account so I've been wading into that world, and there are some dancers that have achieved a kind of celebrity that's specific to TikTok, and that's interesting in its own right, like the Charlie D'Amelios of the world, like this is their environment. Um, but I've actually had more fun seeing how dancers who've already had some success in the mainstream dance world are adapting to the restrictions and the quirks of the platform. Um, one of my favorites is actually Blueprint. He's at B-L-U-P-R-I-N-T-0-1 on TikTok. His real name is Dorian Hector. Um, he's been on so you, Think, so you Think You Can Dance. He has a degree of notoriety already, but his style is called animation um, because it's supposed to look like stop motion animation, like really tiny ticks. Um, and the way he's reinterpreted some of the big dance challenges on the app, like incorporating that style into them, it's like poetic. Um Partly because he's one of the most musical dancers I've seen. He like I'd almost compare him to Tyler Peck in terms of the way he lives inside the music. Um, but he's you should look him up. But yeah, that has been illuminating. Figuring out that whole that whole little sector of the of the dance universe. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see dancers who primarily dance you know in traditional settings crossing over into new platforms because of. Um, because of coronavirus, basically. Um, but one thing that I like, I know we already talked about the Justin Bieber videos in a previous episode, but I really like Ian Eastwood's new video. Um, yeah, and I like that he's been more, he's been more vocal, um, I think, on social media about different issues, which is interesting. And he recently joined Rocksteady Crew, um, which I, is, is definitely not um, a typical move. Um, so, yeah getting more into commercial dance these days a little bit. Well, and something I'm also curious about and fascinated by is the number of companies and choreographers who are putting streams of their performances that have been canceled online in various ways, um, which is, again, very lucky for us. We get to watch this stuff anyway. But I'm curious about what the long-term impact on how dance lives on the internet will be, particularly in regards to traditionally concert dance uh, companies and choreographers and spaces. Um, okay. Well, before we sign off this week, here's the answer to our pop quiz from the top of the episode. Um, which of the following celebrities has not attended one of DJ Dines' club quarantine virtual dance parties? Michelle Obama, Jennifer Lopez, Elizabeth Warren, Naomi Campbell, Drake, Oprah, Jimmy Fallon, Joe Biden, Rihanna, or Usher? And the answer is that it's a trick question. Every single one of those celebs has joined in those huge Instagram live dance parties, and many more have too. I mean, the list is truly insane. 
So D Nice is a DJ, um, rapper, beatboxer. Um, he started in the '80s rap group Boogie Down Productions, um, but he um, has been doing these live dance parties on Instagram, and um, and he's now teaming up with Michelle Obama for her nonprofit When We All Vote for an Instagram live event called Couch Party, and he's going to um, play a live set while volunteers text voters to help them, or eligible voters rather, to help them register to vote. Um, I went to one party. It was it was fun. The music was great. There was it was funny to see you know different friends of mine um, popping up, their names popping up alongside you know these big celebrities' names too. So <laughs> it was it was a fun time. I mean, I think it was, what, more than 100,000 people yes. who tuned in to Saturday night's party, which was nine hours long. Yes. Finding yeah. community where you can. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for joining us this week. We'll be back next week for more discussion of all the news that's moving the dance world. And be sure to sign up for the Daily Dance Edit newsletter at thedanceedit.com to get up-to-date information. And also to follow us on Twitter at dance underscore edit for live updates on the pandemic specifically. We're posting them there. Um, keep dancing, everyone. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, Lydia Murray, and Cadence Neenan. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us with those footfall sounds. Find out more about The Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com.